I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to this week's Cyber Church Ministry. You know, I'm telling you, I love meeting with you every week. I just wish I could see all of you face to face. I'm actually planning on putting together some online meetings that we can have that are interactive where you can ask questions, that sort of thing. I'll be telling you more about that as time goes by. But you know what? I love connecting with you. I love investing in your life. Today, we're going to be talking about something I think is going to help you. We're still on the concept of paradigms, perspectives, and the glory of God. But today, the title of this, of this teaching today is, I think you're controlling me. If you feel like you're being controlled, or if you need to help and minister to somebody who feels like they're being controlled, I'm telling you, you, you want this because this is going to launch you out into an uh, area of freedom that you never, ever, ever imagined. Now listen, I got something free I want to give you, but I'll be back in just a minute. I've got a great free download for you this month. The attitude that always win. All you've got to do to get this free message is click right there on the right hand top side of your screen and you can get it right now in your inbox. You know, in 45 years of doing counseling, doing personal ministry, and you know something, I am so thankful that I get to be personally involved with people. Even though we're a worldwide ministry, even though so much of what we do is online and in seminars and in books and in teaching CDs, you know, I am still intimately involved with ministering to people. Even though now most of the people I get to minister to are leaders because that's where that's, I have to put my time where it can multiply the most. I, I love just getting one-on-one with people. I was talking today, I, I, I do a podcast with my friends, Bob and Audrey Miser in Canada. And, uh, you know, we, I was telling them one of the reasons I enjoy working with them so much is because they too are intimately involved with a lot of one-on-one -on -one ministry. I'm, I'm telling you, if you've got marriage problems and you want to work them through and you want to learn how to have a great marriage relationship, I'm telling you, you can contact Bob and Audrey Miser and you, you will be amazed at what, at what they can help you do. They have all kinds of of uh, developmental programs for marriages. But one of the reasons I love working with people like Bob and Audrey or, or Jimmy Bratcher or, or, some of, or, or some of these different people is because when most ministry, so, so I say most, so much ministry that I've been exposed to throughout my life in America and around the world, you had people standing in the podium and, you know, while I thank God for all the great pastors, there are wonderful pastors that do an incredible job, wonderful counselors that really help people. The real truth is I can tell within the first five minutes of listening to somebody preach or teach or, or do counseling if they ever actually deal with people one-on-one, -on -one, if they ever actually listen to people. Because, you know, you don't want a lot of theoretical stuff when you're sitting in church. You don't want a lot of theoretical stuff when you're sitting there in a counseling appointment. Because what tends to happen is that religious leaders who are not involved with people, they may be good people, they may have great insights, but they tend to answer the questions that no one is actually asking. And so when I get to work with people who actually work one-on-one -on -one with people as much as they can, <coughs> Or when I get to work with people who, who always take time to spend time individually, you know, ministering to people, they know what people are asking. They know what the needs are of people. I want to tell you something. We all, all of us who are involved in ministering to people one-on-one, -on -one, because of the way the world is, I'm telling you what, there is such, there is such a crash, bang, I'm going to control you movement going on in the world. I'm going to control you. And here's the interesting thing about controllers. You know, controllers, so, some, sometimes controllers just try brute force. And if they, can't, if they can't intimidate you and use brute force, then they just shift to something else. And maybe then they, then, then they shift into quality control. I'm going to just show you, I'm going to make you feel like you're not doing things right. I'm going to, make, I'm going to show you how you're going to do it if it's right. If that doesn't work, then they'll shift over. I'm, make, I'm going to make you feel guilty. If that doesn't work, I'm going to shift over to making you feel stupid stupid. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to shift over to some other type of manipulation. And, and it's, it's like controllers just cycle through all of these different ways to control people until they find the one that works. And when that stops working, they, they start something else. <clears throat> but I want to tell you something. Here's one of the greatest things that you're ever going to discover about control. And don't turn me off when I say this. Don't go away because I'm going to, I'm going to get you to, to a place where you can have real freedom. See, 
the question usually that has to be established before you start to deal with the real problem is this. Are you controlling me or do I just think you're controlling me? I want to tell you something. Remember, we're talking about paradigms, perspectives, points of view, or the glory of God. And, and, and that, those are the choices. You know, I can have my paradigm, I can have the glory of God. I can have my opinion, or I can have the glory of God. I can have my point of view, or, or I can have the glory of God. Because the glory of God, all of the splendor, all the greatness, all the majesty, all the miraculousness, if there is such a word, of, of God's glory exists for one reason, because that's how he sees it. That's his view. That's his opinion. That's his truth. And his truth, his view, his opinion is the reality. And we can only escape the situations that we're in when we begin, first of all, to see our situation from a different perspective. When we break free of the controlling concepts of controlling models that we have in our mind, the controlling ideas that we have in our mind. And we start seeing it from another perspective. We can, we can get a new opinion. And if we get a new opinion, we can get a new paradigm. And if that paradigm is based on who God is and in us, man, I'm going to tell you something. We can, we can break free from anything. So is, is, is someone really controlling me? Or is, are they controlling me just because I think that they're controlling me? Now, I tell this to people all the time, and this is so incredibly important. The mind has to have equilibrium because uh, uh, in, in order to feel sane. So the mind always has for everything to balance out. In other words, my point of view has to be justified by something else, by some other information. And so the mind feeds and defends and seeks to protect the ego. And the ego is the, ego is the false sense of identity. It's the false sense of safety. It's the false sense of who I really am. And, and I've got to preserve that by being sure that I'm never wrong. And so the mind seeks to always make you believe that your point of view is right, even if that point of view is totally wrong and even if that point of view is destroying your life. And so many times the things that we think people are doing to us is actually just our uh, uh, paradigm. It, it, it's how we see things. It's our perspective based on what my emotions are, based on what my, my life experience is. You know, if I grew up, <clears throat> I, I'll give you an example. You know, you know, some of my children are adopted. And, uh, you know, of course, in my heart, I know no difference between my birth children and my adopted children. I mean, I, don't, I, can't, I can't feel the difference. I can't see the difference. I never think of it any different. I love them all equally, and, and I'm thankful for each one of them. My adopted children came from a background of, of, um, uh, of violence and control and domination. So when, 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 when they first came into my life, you know, I'm, I'm, I like to talk things out. Now, I know I've got a pretty intense behavior pattern, and I know that, that I can unintentionally be intimidating and uh, that sometimes I don't realize, you know, when I am being intimidating. I do more now. When I was younger, I didn't. But, uh, you know, I've always worked from this perspective of if we can talk, if we can communicate, we can work anything out. And no problem is too big. If you can just talk it through, be objective, don't give me, don't tell me, you know, you know, don't tell me what you feel right now. Just tell me what the facts are and then we'll get, you know, then we'll get to the feelings. So, so many times with my kids, I would sit down with them and say, there'd be some kind of a problem. I say, look, uh, we, we need to, we really need to talk this through because this, you know, this is a problem. And man, all of a sudden they would just shut down, bam, stop talking, stop communicating. And you would think in any minute that they're going to curl up in the corner in the fetal position. And you know, I was young. I didn't understand a lot about behavior at the time. And, and, and you know, it would, it would hurt my feelings. It would make me mad. It would seem so irrational. I said, what the heck? I'm, you know, I'm just trying, I'm trying to solve problems. And they're refusing to talk to me. They're refusing to solve problems. Well, you know, what I didn't take into account, you see, what they had been conditioned to was when their biological father would say, we, we got to talk. Really what that meant was he was going to throw a screaming, cussing fit 
if he didn't get his way and probably physically just whip them or beat the daylights out of them, you know, one or the other. So when I came in and said, I said, hey, we need to talk from their perspective. In other words, from their life experience, which had created a paradigm. And remember, every time you look at anything, you're looking through the veil of your life experience, the veil of your paradigm, the veil of how you interpret things. Even though I was sitting down to reconcile and solve the problem peaceably, from their perspective, they were expecting violence. They were expecting domination. They were expecting irrational communication. And so their reaction to me, and it'd be interesting, I'd go back to them sometimes and, and, and say, what happened the other day when we were trying to talk? And they'd say, well, you, you were screaming at me. And I'm like, uh, you know, I've actually never raised my voice to you. I, I, don't, I don't know if in, in, in my, all of my kids, their whole lives, I don't know if I've ever raised my voice more than a half a dozen times or a dozen times. Now, I might look at them real straight now and say something stronger than they want me to say, but I've never raised my voice. But you know what? That was, that was their experience. Well, I'll tell you something. So many times you think someone is controlling you when in fact it just looks that way from your life experience. I'll be right back. Don't go away. We're going to solve this problem. My new series, Paradigms, Perspective, and the Glory of God is designed to do just what it sounds like. I want you to see, to perceive, and to experience the glory of God, the reality of God, the splendor of God, the greatness of God, the power of God in every single area of your life. And I'll tell you something, when you can see God's reality, you can believe God's reality. And when you believe God's reality, you will experience in every part of your life. You definitely want this series. You know, there's an interesting story in the Bible. When Jesus was crucified, there was a uh, a servant girl. You remember there was the prophecy. Jesus told Peter, he said, you, you know, before the uh, rooster crows, you're going to deny me. And uh, so Peter was warming himself by a fire and, and a servant girl came up and, and said, well, hey, aren't you one of those followers of this guy from Nazareth, this Jesus guy? And, uh, and Peter, he denied it and swore a curse on himself and, and all this kind of stuff. And I've always been amazed at that when you consider that this wasn't a soldier threatening his life. This wasn't uh, someone that could have ha imprisoned him. This was just a little servant girl. And this kind of takes me, you know, there's a scripture in Proverbs, Proverbs 20, 29, 25, that says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord shall be safe. Now, I'm sure there is some aspect in the fear of man that has to do with fear of physical suffering, physical pain. But the reality of it is, at least in this generation, and really this applied a lot in Jesus' day, the fear of man is pretty much the fear of what other people thinks about me. The fear of how people will view me. The fear of whether or not I'll be accepted or rejected. So in, in the fear of man, you have to understand that we look at someone and based on what our fears are, we project that onto them. Now remember, the mind seeks equilibrium. So anything that I believe or really any fear that I have that, that I'm trying to protect then I'm going to project certain things onto every person that comes around me. And if I believe that they're going to reject me and I'm afraid of rejection, if I believe that they're going to control me and I'm afraid uh, uh, to stand up for myself and have boundaries. In other words, whatever it is I'm afraid of, I'm going to have a tendency to look for that in people. And many times I'm going to project that onto people and I'm going to pass a judgment. In other words, uh, uh, here, here's a good example. You know, uh, Again, you know, I don't mind, I don't like, I don't really like conflict, but I don't mind conflict if conflict moves me toward helping somebody or if conflict moves me toward resolving a problem. In other words, you know, if, if I know that somebody is, is rational and they're the kind of person you can sit down and just have a, a, a honest disagreement with and, and, and figure out how to get past it, then I'm fine to sit down with somebody and look them in the eye and say, look, I don't like what's happening here. I don't like what you're doing. Or, 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 you know, you made me mad when you said this, or you hurt my feelings when you said this, or, you know, I'm having trouble trusting you. So, you know, I, I'm not 
I'm not great. I don't love doing it, but I'll do it because it's, it's a means to an end. It's a means to the end of, of, of conflict. So you take a person that is afraid of conflict, that has a dread of conflict, that has a dread of confrontation, and you go up to that person and you say, uh, look, uh, we've we got to solve this problem, we, or we've got to talk about this, or you know, how, whatever word you may say to them. I want to tell you something. That person will project their fear of conflict onto you. And the way they will tell this story when they leave, they won't walk away and say, man, he, I didn't like, he looked at me awful intense when we were talking, and I don't know what it means. They won't walk away and say, man, he asked me some questions, and you know what, honestly, I, I, was, I was so intimidated that, that, that I was afraid to answer him. They won't walk away and say that. They will walk away and say, he was controlling, he was rude, or she was rude. In other words, we project this in there. Remember, in judgment, I don't have time to go into all of the concepts of judgment. If you want to know more about that, go back and listen to my series, uh, which, which is available on our website, How to Stop the Pain. If, <clears throat> if in judgment we project onto other people, we make a judgment about why they are doing what they do. And see, that gets into determining good and evil. At the core, the root core of judgment is determining good and evil. And so to determine good and evil in other people's uh, behavior, we have to assume to know why they're doing what they're doing so we can pass that judgment of, of, of good or evil. And so the moment you assume to know why someone is doing something, you're passing a judgment, you're projecting your fears, you're projecting something onto them. And, uh, and I'm, you know, in marriages, in relationships, this, you know, this is February. We, we, I try to slant everything a little bit in February toward how it applies in relationships. In relationships, we do this all the time. And we project onto other people why they do what they do. Now, people who, people who feel disempowered, people who feel like the world out there is more powerful than they are, or sometimes people who need an excuse to not be personally responsible will project onto other people that they are being controlled. Sometimes what that other person is doing is just making decisions because you won't make them. Sometimes what that other person is doing is taking action because, because you won't take action. Now, True, they should learn not to take action for you or make decisions that involve you. But, but you know, sometimes in marriages, you don't leave that other person any choice because you just won't do it. There's an interesting saying that, that I think applies to this situation. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. See, we have this tendency to look at other people and assume how they're looking at us, assume what they think of us. Always, I think I used this example last month, but you know, the children of Israel, man, they sent spies into the promised land. God had, had, had given them victory after victory after victory as they came through the wilderness and they get to the promised land. They, they send the spies in and, and they go in and they come back with this report. Man, it's like, man, this place is flowing with milk and honey. This is incredible. There's incredible houses. There's, in, man, there's, there's vineyards with giant grapes on them. I mean, this is amazing. And so it's like, everybody's like, well, let's go. And they're like, well, but wait a minute. They said, there's giants in that land. And so they look at us and they see us as grasshoppers. And then basically they said, and that's how we see ourselves in their eyes. Well, you know something? That absolutely wasn't true. The truth is we found out later that the kings of those, of those tribes, of those nations that existed in the promised land, they were dreading the, the children of Israel coming because they had been hearing reports about how they were conquering and, 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 and obliterating other armies as they, as they came through the wilderness. Now, they didn't do it at first when, when they first came out of Egypt, but, but as God began to take them into uh, prepare them to go in and take the promised land, man, they started conquering all these other cities and kingdoms and kings. And I'll tell you what, they, they were dreading, the inhabitants were dreading the children of Israel coming in there because they were afraid and they believed their God 
would give the children of Israel victory. But you see, the moment you pass a judgment or project onto somebody that I think you see me this way. And so because I think you see me this way, I start acting a certain way. I, you know, I may resist and become defiant or I may, I may succumb and cow down and, and become, and become uh, complacent. But our tendency is to think what somebody else thinks about us or try to figure out what somebody else intends or to try to figure out why someone else is controlling me. You know, you know something, n n nobody's controlling you unless they are physically making you do something. You know, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, where it talks about, it says, judge not that you be not judged. And it's not, not talking about God judging you, it's talking about people judging you. Compare that to Luke 6, 38. Give and shall be given to you. Press down and shake and gather and run over. Shall men give into your bosom. That's talking about judgment there. Go back and look at it. Luke 6, 36 through 38. And, and, and so, so what we get back from people, what comes to us back from people is not just what they intend to give to us and do to us, but what comes back from people is all based on the, the judgments that we place on them. And that's why Matthew 7 verse 2 says, with the measure you meet, it's measure to you. In other words, what comes back to you from somebody is based on what you have measured out to them. So, you know, <clears throat> most situation, and again, I've done years of marriage counseling, relationship counseling. Most situation where someone says he or she is controlling me, they're not controlling you. Most of the time, you're projecting that onto them because you're afraid to have boundaries. You're afraid to stand up for yourself. You're afraid to be who you really are in Jesus. Well, if I, you know, if I stand up, there's going to be conflict. You know what? Sometimes conflict is just the way to get to the solution. Sometimes standing up means I have enough respect for myself, and I'm going to show you that you've got to have respect for me. Sometimes standing up means I've got boundaries and you're going to respect these boundaries. See, we train other people how to treat us. It's very important you understand that. When we allow people to cross our boundaries, when we allow people to insult us, when we allow people to impose their will upon us, unless they are doing it by brute force, then we're complying. Just, just because we think it's easier, just because, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is we're afraid of. But in doing that, we are giving them permission to do it again. We're saying, you'll get what you want if you treat me this way. You know, uh, Ray, there's a lot of similarities, and people get mad when I say this, but there's a lot of similar, similarities in training a pet and training a child. Because, see, the first stage of ch child training is conditioning. You don't jump right straight to values and morals and ethics. and that kind. Of, you start out with conditioning. And conditioning is all pretty much based on reward response. Now, that doesn't change their heart. It, it just conditions them to understand, you know, consequences. Well, you know, when you're training, training a puppy, <clears throat> one of the first rules of training a puppy is you never reward bad behavior. Somebody walks in the door of your house, that puppy goes wild and starts jumping around. Nobody pets him until he calms down and sits down. You know, every time when my, when my dog was, was, was a puppy, every time I would feed him, I would take him, I would carry his food to a certain place, I would tell him to sit down, I would set the food down, and I would tell him to wait. And he, and he would have to wait until I gave him permission to eat. Well, what that said is, that's, see, that's not abuse. What that says is, when you're calm, it's going to be rewarded. Well, see something? We, we, we've got to teach people, when you're kind, it's rewarded. But when you're brutal, it's not. I'll tell you something, I'll be right back with the mentoring moment. To go, don't go anywhere, I'm going to show you how to put this into practice for real. Have you ever just felt like you couldn't see the truth? I've had people say that to me so many times. I just can't see it. Well, I'll tell you something. In this new series, Paradigms, Perspectives, and the Glory of God, your eyes are going to open and you're going to discover how to always see what God's Word means and says. You know, Jesus didn't call you to be a Christian. He called you to be a believer. He called you to be a disciple. He called you to be a son. He called you to be an heir. He didn't call you just 
to be a Christian. I want to tell you something. Everything about Impact Ministries is about making disciples, developing people to know who they are in Jesus, developing people uh, to see Christ as He really is and to understand God through Him. That's why Jesus is Lord. And really, that is the foundation of this whole ministry. No matter what subjects we teach on, it always goes back to who was Jesus, what He say, what did He accomplish, and who are we because we are in Him. So I want to invite you. Be sure and, and watch these broadcasts, share these broadcasts, but I also want to invite you to help me take this gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. You see, we are not living in the kingdom if we are not surrendering to the lordship of Jesus. Most of the world has waved their hands at Jesus, but they've never made him Lord. Join me as a world changer. Listen. Before I dive into the mentoring moment, I just want to remind you, be sure and like this video, and you can, you can do that right now, and then at the end of this, don't run away at the end of this mentoring moment, be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will cause more people to hear and see these messages, so you'll be helping me to touch more people's lives. Now listen, <clears throat> we have to accept the fact that if we are giving up our control, if someone is not physically forcing us to give up our choices, then we are doing it simply out of what the Bible calls the fear of man. Maybe the desire to be accepted. Maybe it's the desire to avoid conflict. Maybe it's the desire for that person to like you. Uh, maybe you think that's the only way to get what you want. But Remember, if you give someone control of your life, you are allowing them to usurp the lordship of Jesus in your life. Your process in life is to become who you really are and who you want to be in Jesus. And that should be what your spouse does. Now, you know, we can't speak for your boss or for all these other people. But something that I want to encourage you to do, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. And I want you to do this. If, if you're struggling with feeling like other people have the ability to control you, and here's what I want you to do. Every single night for the next 90 days, about 15 minutes before you're ready to go to sleep, I want you to write down in cursive, longhand, I just want you to write out this statement that says, I am in complete control of my life. I am free to make all of my choices. I am in complete control of my life. I am free to make all of my choices. And what will happen by you writing that down just before you go to sleep, it's going to influence your inner workings in such a way that God can speak to your heart. Just do this for 90 days and see what begins to change in your life. Listen, don't give your power away. Don't give your life away. One day, God's going to want to do something great through you. And if you think you have to ask somebody else for permission, you'll get paralyzed and it'll never happen.